Happy New Year, everyone. Happy Clapping Year in Jesus' name. Amen. That means he will do it for you, for me, for everyone. Let me talk to our people on the other side. Bill Lucian Park. Il le fera ce qu'il a promisé. He will do everything he has promised in Jesus' name. This year, the trees of the field will clap their hands. The members of his church will clap their hands. The promises of God will be fulfilled in every life this year in Jesus' name. All the things we have cried about, all the tears in his bottle, the answers to those problems, to those challenges, those answers will come. A new year. Happy, healthy, progressive, powerful, conquering. This is your year. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you and bless your name for your goodness. We know that you have come to bless your people this year, and we pray beyond our prayer beyond our expectation, beyond what you have done in the past, you will do even this year in Jesus' name. Open the windows of heaven. Open the doors of heaven and bless your people abundantly this year in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Give me another shouting, clapping, amen. God bless you, you can sit down. Tonight we come to our second Sunday. In this a new year, and it is a covenant Sunday. And I pray that covenant blessings will be upon every life, even today in Jesus' name. We're coming to Jeremiah chapter 31, and I'm reading from verse 33. It says, but they shall be the covenant that I will make in the, with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Now we're talking about contract. A contract, a covenant, they're similar. When God makes a contract or a covenant, there are two sides to the covenant. We have the sight of God. He is the covenanter, covenantal. And then we have the side of his people, the covenantees. The people on those two sides, you have the document that states the promise, the performance, and what is going to happen, and the condition that you have to meet between the covenantor and the covenantee. And it states the condition there that this is what I will do. But you have a part, this is what you will do. It's like uh, the marriage covenant that the husband has a part and the wife has a part. And it is the fulfillment of those uh, covenant conditions that will bring the blessings upon us. Here God now himself 
talks about the covenant and he talks about the part of the covenantees, the people who are the beneficiaries of that covenant. And so he says, this is what I will do. In any contract, in any covenant, there's a writing so that the person making the covenant, initiating the covenant, can look at that document and say, this is what I said, and this is the blessing I said I will give, and this is your part. And so he gives us the covenant, and he says, I will write that in the heart of the people that are making covenant with me. It says, this shall be the covenant that I will make. He is the originator of the covenant. He is the one that tells us what the promises are, what the conditions are. And he says, after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. It's a covenant that makes him write his word, his covenant, the promises, the expectations, the conditions in our heart so that every time we'll be remembering this is what he said this is what he promised and this is the expectation coming from him that we will have to do look at verse 34 there in verse 34 it says and they shall teach no more every man is neighbor why because he has written the covenant conditions and the covenant promises and the covenant precepts in our heart. It's put them on the table of our mind. And so you don't have to come and remind me. I don't have to come and remind you when that thing is written clearly in every heart. And it says, and every man is brother, saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them. He said, there'll be nobody just coming as an onlooker. There'll be nobody coming as a spectator. Everyone will know me. Everyone will be born by the Spirit of God, born again and belonging unto the Lord. And they have their hearts with the Lord and they have their minds in the Lord and they have the law of God in their hearts. It says, because they shall all know me from the least of them even to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Look at chapter 32. I was looking at verse 38. In chapter 32, verse 38, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But you understand, uh, that's not automatic. It says, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. There is a condition that he has given. It's the condition of repentance. It's the condition of restoration. It's the condition of regeneration. A new life in any man be in Christ. It's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new on that condition that we repent on that condition, we are restored to the original situation how Adam and Eve totally belong to the Lord before they fell. He said, they shall be my people and I will be their God. In verse 39, he tells us, and I will give them one heart. I will give all of them the same kind of heart. Think about Enoch, the same heart he had. Think about Samuel, the same heart he had. Think about Jeremiah, the same heart he had. Think about Paul Peter that laid everything on the altar and totally committed themselves unto the Lord. 
that's the same heart I will give everyone. It says, and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. Then in verse 40, it says in verse 40, and I will make an everlasting covenant for them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts, all of them. All the people that have covenant with the Lord, he'll put honor. The honor we give to the person we respect, we hallow, we honor. And the fear, the filial fear that we have towards God. And we're conscious of his honor. We're conscious of his, of his glory all the time. Because of that, we fear to offend him. We fear to contradict him. We fear to influence any other person around us to go against the Lord. In any way, we never forget ourselves because it's written in our heart. The, the value and the virtue of following after God and helping other people, encouraging other people to, uh, to fear the Lord. It says, I'll put my fear in their hearts and they shall not depart from me. They will not be Sunday, Sunday Christians, Sunday, Sunday believers in the market. They will not depart from me. In the home, they will not depart from me. In every action, every action of their hands, they will not depart from me. That the covenant the Lord is making. And today, we're looking at the heart of the new covenant. The heart of the new covenant. Everything has a heart. If the heart is deformed, if the heart is weak, if the heart is unstable, if the heart is not active, doing what he taught to do, it will affect the whole body. And if the heart of the covenant is tampered with, then it will affect the fulfillment and the performance of the covenant, the heart of the new covenant. We're looking at three things here. Number one is the heart. Number two is the healing. Number three is the holiness. Number one is the cleansed heart. Number two is the confirmed healing. Number three is the crucial holiness. Point number one, the cleansed heart for the everlasting covenant. The cleansed heart. You bring your heart to the Lord. It says, my son, my daughter, give me your heart. And as you bring that heart, he cleanses the heart. He purges the heart. He prepares the heart for inheriting the possibilities and the promises in the covenant. Number one, the cleansed heart in the everlasting covenant. Number two, in the confirmed healing in the new covenant. It was in the old covenant. And it comes to the new covenant and Christ has now become the sacrifice and our substitute and the one that helps us to have the healing benefit in the new covenant. Number two, in the confirmed healing in the new covenant. Number three, the crucial holiness crucial holiness that's what crucial means important it's something you cannot deal without it means essential when you say something this is crucial this is important and this is indispensable this is an essential commodity number three then is the crucial important essential indispensable Holiness in the holy covenant. Let's come to number one now. Number one is the cleansed heart for the everlasting covenant. Let's look at that again in Jeremiah, reading from chapter 32. And we're looking at verse 38. In Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 38, it says, And they shall be my people, and I will be be their God. Then he tells us in verse 39, in verse 39, and I will give them one heart, the heart 
the art before. I have to replace that heart. All those children of Israel, and they came out of the land of Egypt, and they were going to the land of Canaan. If they had art, a cleansed heart, if they had art, a consecrated heart, if they had art, a heart that focuses on me, not on them, not on their bread, not on their water, not on their needs. If they had focused their heart on me, they would not have perished. In the wilderness, 600,000 men that came out of the land of Egypt. And then they, those who had wives and then children, that's why we calculated the number of the people, about 3 million that came out of the land of Egypt. Just the younger generation were able to get there. Why? Because he said, I will circumcise your heart and the heart of your children so that you will love me with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. They didn't take their heart to the Lord to be circumcised. And then their children, they didn't tell their children the importance and the significance of that circumcision of heart. But now he says, they couldn't enter in because their hearts were not ready. Now he says, and I will give them one heart and one way. If we have one heart, we'll have one way. If we have one heart, we'll have one passion. We'll have one path. We, because we have one heart, one vision, one decision one dedication and we have one decision to follow after the Lord now as we talk about our having covenant with the Lord that's what he wants to do first of all he wants to give one heart so that you can follow one direction so that you can have one goal one ideal one purpose and you want to go that same direction that God in heaven has mapped out for us and that Christ has described very well the narrow way that leads to glory land and he says I'll give them one heart I'll give them one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of the children after them. Then in verse 40, it says in verse 40, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them that I will not turn away from them. He turned away from the children of Israel and he abandoned them. He said, all right, your heart is not with me. Your heart is not for me. And he went to the land of Babylon in captivity. But now he says, I'm going to have this everlasting covenant with them that they will not turn away from me and I will not turn away from them to do them good but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me and then in verse 41 verse 41 yea I will rejoice over them to do them good and I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart my whole heart if they follow the lord with their whole heart then god said with his whole heart he'll bless them if they bring their soul their mind everything and they're serving god without reservation all their soul all their mind all their heart if they serve him without reservation, he too will bless them without reservation. It says, with my whole heart and with my whole soul. And that's how Abraham had the blessing of God. Because he came to God with a faithful heart. He served the Lord with his whole heart. There was no reservation. There was no looking back. Everything he knew. You know, the Bible was not reaching at that time and Yet, look at Abraham. Abraham, here am I, Lord. 
take that son your only son whom you love and go sacrificing to me it says in the mountain that i will show you and the very early morning the first day uh, the, 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 the next morning he rose up took the son without consultation without compromise without discussion and he had those servants with him and then he took the son and laid the wood on him and he took the knife and the fire and then he went to the mountain that the lord had chosen with all the heart all the soul without any reservation and then he told those servants tarry here i will go yonder and worship the lord and we both of us he believed that the covenant of the lord will not change he had told me that through this son it will make him a blessing to the whole world and now he told him to sacrifice the son he didn't delay dally. He didn't delay with all his soul, with all his heart, with all his mind. He took that son and God said, because you have obeyed me and you follow me with your whole heart, I will bless you with my whole heart. That's what he's saying. Look at Nehemiah chapter 9 and I'm reading there from verse 7. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 7. Thou art the Lord, the God who did choose Abraham and brought him forth out of all of the Chaldeans and gavest him the name of Abraham. Why? Look at verse 8. In verse 8, and foundest his heart faithful before thee. Foundest his heart faithful. You know, when you come to the Lord and we're making this a great covenant with the Lord, you must find our heart faithful and it's out of the heart we have all the issues of life you cannot repent without your heart going into it and you cannot obey the lord without your heart being totally submissive unto what god is saying and when that's what god found in abraham that you found his heart faithful before thee and made us a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites and the Gagashites to give it, I say, to his seed and has performed thy words. You found him faithful in heart. And because you were faithful in the heart, you have now performed your words, for thou art righteous. In Psalm 51, reading from verse 5, that's why the Lord wants to cleanse our heart, so that in the cleansed heart that you have the performance of all the promises of the new covenant it tells us here in uh, psalm 51 verse 5 behold i was shapen iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me verse 6 in verse 6 it says behold thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom then it says in verse 7 in verse 7 perch me with Esau and I shall be clean. For God to fulfill the covenant he had made him with David, he needed a purged heart, a pardoned heart, a purified heart, a cleansed heart. He says, purge me with Esau, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. In verse 8, it says, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Then in verse 9 it says, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Verse 10 create in me a clean heart. That's the prayer we need to pray. We need to make sure that our hearts are clean, we're purged, we're purified and we have a heart made ready for the covenant the covenant the Lord has made 
he is righteous our hearts must be righteous he's so pure eyes than to behold iniquity and he doesn't want to behold iniquity every time we come and what are you coming for i come to claim the covenant blessings but look at your heart i need to cleanse that heart. it's say create in me clean heart to god and renew a right spirit within me look at Deuteronomy chapter 30 we're looking at verse 6 if, if he's to fulfill the covenant he wants to handle that problem of the heart first and he says in Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 6 and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart what does that mean you know circumcision of the flesh takes away the extra flesh you're brought into the world and uh, it's it will be a storage for bacteria bad bacteria it will be a storage for disease it will be a storage for um, you know things that will uh, disturb your whole system it goes from there to all the parts of the body now circumcision removes all that so that everything will be clear in the natural now the heart also has something it brought into the world it's called depravity it's called the Adamic nature and that Adamic nature causes problem because as Adam made excuse that nature of excuse making why did you do this excuse how didn't you do that excuse couldn't you have done better excuse how about this look at the result and the reward and the the consequence of your action excuse it came from adam and eve never going straight never telling the truth never being transparent we brought that adamic nature depravity with us in the world and we cannot you hypocritical maneuvering hanky panky what the lord we have to be straightforward if we are going to be in covenant with the god who can see through he can see everything that anybody is doing and so he said so that your heart will be cleansed and your heart will be pure and your heart will be circumcised ready for the covenant i'm making with you and the lord thy god will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed what the consequence of that to love the lord thy god with all thine heart when that cleansing has been done, when that circumcision has been done, you will love the Lord thy God above your comfort. You love the Lord your God above your comfort so zone. You love the Lord your God above your preferences. You love the Lord your God above money, above material things, because He wants to be the one you depend upon you, you uh, dependent all the time and then it says you will love the lord your god with all your heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live look at verse uh, verse 19 in verse 19 it says i call heaven and earth to record this day against you that i have said before thee life and death blessing and cursing therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live you see the the covenant is not imposed on us no not at all it says you have a choice i want to bless you there's a personality that doesn't want you to be blessed and that personality works with your heart he knows what you will do that i will say okay my covenant is no more with you but you have a choice there's life there is a death and there's blessing there's cause to choose life that you may live and then he tells us in verse 20 in verse 20 he says that thou mayest love the Lord thy God with all and then that thou mayest obey his voice and that thou mayest cleave unto him for he is thy life 
and the length of thy days that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord thy God swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. He expects that we will love him with our hearts, not with our head, not with our mouth, but not with words, but with action. Our action will show the thoughts of our heart, our disposition. It will be shown by what we do in our obedience to the Lord. And it is that kind of obedience that shows the cleansed heart and the, and the, the consecrated heart and the circumcised heart for the covenant. In 1 Kings chapter 8, reading from verse 23, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 23, and he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above and or on earth beneath, uh, beneath. Then he says, who keepest covenant? He Keepest covenant. If the covenant promises are not fulfilled in any life, in any family, in any local church, in any denomination altogether, if we are not experiencing the fulfillment, the performance of the covenant promises, the fault is not on God's side because He is the one who keeps covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart. Look at that all the time. You keep the covenant with the people that have a heart, a heart to follow the Lord, not just religious people who just come to worship every Sunday, but their heart is not in the worship. The new heart is not kind of instilled, created in them. You fulfill the covenant with the people that walk before thee with all their heart. Look at verse 56. It tells us the outcome of people walking with all their heart before the Lord. Blessed be the Lord that has given rest unto his people Israel according to all that he promised. Remember verse 23 where read for us, these are people that are following after the Lord with all their heart. And now he says that these people, they have the fulfillment of everything God has promised. And then he said, there has not one word failed of all the good promise which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. We're looking at Second Kings chapter 23, and we're reading from verse 1. Second Kings chapter 23, reading from verse 1. And the king sent and gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. Then in verse 2, in verse 2 it says, And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the... And and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, all the inhabitants, all the citizens, everyone. And then it says, and the priests as well, and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. Both small and great. Great. You know, everyone is involved in the covenant, and each one has to take his part, and he has to give his heart unto the Lord. If it's a little heart, little heart, little mouth, little hands, give yourself to me. If it's a big heart, an aged heart, give your heart to me, anyone. If it's a female heart, give your heart to me. If a male heart, give your heart to me. The Lord deals with us, not on the basis of gender, not on the basis of age. He deals with us on the basis of the heart. And it says, all of them small and great, and he read in their ears of the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house 
house of the Lord. And then in verse 3, in verse 3 it says, And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments. That's the heart he expects. It's not just, you know, this is a covenant Sunday, covenant month, and we're here and we leave our heart at home and we leave our consecration behind and we leave our commitment behind and we leave the desire, the passion for holiness and righteousness. We leave all that behind and then we come for covenant. There's no covenant without the heart. You will bring your heart with you, a heart that is convicted, a heart that is converted, a heart that is consecrated, a heart that is cleansed, a heart that is totally committed and devoted unto the Lord. We must bring our heart, and it says they did that, and his testimonies and his, and his statutes with their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people stood to the covenant. All the people stood to the covenant. Nobody was passive. Nobody just said, okay, go ahead and, uh, you know, finish the preaching. And when you're finished, I'm here. I want this. I want this. Pray for us. Yes, we'll pray. But, you know, we have to go through everything and know that this is what is reaching. And then we, we, we uh, give our hearts and we give everything we have according to what is reaching. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 36, and we're reading from verse 25, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. It's God talking, not Ezekiel. It's not the water of Ezekiel. It's not the water of a prophet. It's not the water in the bottle. It's not anything that human beings have taken from the river. They put it in the bottle, and then they sprinkle it. Not, not at all. This is the Almighty God saying, then then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. And from all your filthiness, filthy language, all that will be cleansed off. And filthy behavior, all that will be cleansed off. And filthy exposure. There are people that expose their bodies. And you can see the contour of their body and, uh, you know, and they make other people feel defiled. All that kind of feel the appearance and feel the exposure, it cleans everything away. That, that's what God wants to do. And if you don't want to do that and you want to continue in that feel the exposure, you are not ready for the covenant of the Lord. You are not ready for relationship with the Lord. It says, and from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Anything you exalt above God is an idol. It might be a person, a man, a woman, Exalt him, exalt her above God. That's an idol. It might be your job, your profession. It might be anything on earth. It might be the dust and the sand of the earth, the cement of the earth. It might be property. You exalt above God. That's an idol. And God says, I'm not going to share my glory with any other person or with any property. That's why it says, as you come into a covenant relationship with you, it says, and from all your idols will lie cleanse you. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, and a new heart will I give you. And a new spirit. You see the heart there? It's the heart of the covenant. And the heart that is made to inherit the covenant promises of the Lord. And a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and ye shall, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. God knows whether the heart is soft or hard. He knows whether the heart is the heart of Pharaoh or the heart of a Paul. Paul the Apostle. He knows whether the heart is habitually hardened or is 
permanently something and when he looks at you you come you say you have a good intention you come to me but you know he acts on his word on principle on precept and if your heart is hard it says we have to take another step before you get to the covenant we have to remove the stony heart and he can do that is the creator is the redeemer and he says i will take away the stony heart out of your flesh brothers and sisters if the heart that makes the year old on you the date crossing over from december 31st to january 1st the date does not make the year new in any way it is the covenant of the lord it is the conversion of the soul it is the cleansing of the heart it is the recreation of the heart that makes any period any year any time any period of your life new if you have the same old disobedience the same old hardness the same old unbelief the same old self-will and you carry the self-will from december 31st through to the crossover service and then you land on january 1st on in january the first month of the year and the same unbelief the same disobedience the same disregard for the word of god the same old habit now that you carry to what we call new year you know the the thing keeps on moving you have a vehicle and you put the old kind of dirty fuel into the tank although it's new year but the vehicle does not know date all it knows about the kind of fuel you put in there and if you run on that same old fuel you're going to have the same the same result as you had in the old year that's why god said the very first thing in the heart of the covenant and he says a new heart also will i give you and a new spirit will i put within you and i will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and i will give you an heart of flesh somebody will shout amen look at verse 27 in verse 27 and i will put my spirit within you he wants us saved verse 25 he wants us sanctified verse 26 he wants us filled immersed enveloped empowered baptized in the holy ghost verse 27 and he says tarry ye in the city of jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high from on high if you have the same plastic attitude and the same a heart that will not wait upon the lord so that you can renew your strength if you have the same hurry 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 and you are not ever waiting before the lord to be baptized and filled and immersed and enveloped and empowered with the holy ghost the same weak life you lived in the previous year the same weak life you live today in the new year but it says wait wait they that wait upon the lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not faint and shall walk and not be tired it says and i will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them look at verse 36 in verse 36 i'm reading from the second part there the last line it says uh, 
I have uh, I the Lord have spoken it and I will do it I the Lord have spoken it I'll give a converted heart a cleansed heart a consecrated heart and a circumcised heart I the Lord have spoken it and I will do it okay the Lord will do it I fold my hand I say God I'm waiting you are not praying you're not seeking, you're not searching your heart, and you're not doing what ought to be done, and you just say, I'm waiting. Look at verse 37. In verse 37, thus says the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I have promised it. Why are not sinners saved? Who they say God has promised salvation. If he wants to save me, let him save me. They're not kneeling down. They're not standing up. They're not repenting. They're not forsaking their sin. They're not believing on the Lord. Why are many believers not sanctified and the Adamic nature is not taken away from them? And they go from day to day, from week to week, from month to month, from year to year with an unsanctified heart, uncircumcised heart, because they're not asking. They say that, you know, Christ has provided it and Christ has prayed and, you know, we'll be sanctified they're not praying that as you can tell it's not everybody that lives the sanctified life although they say Christ they believe in sanctification as a doctrine they believe that Christ has provided but they are not asking why are people not baptized in the Holy Ghost oh God has said that you know I will feel you are baptized of the Holy Ghost I'll put my spirit within you but they are not asking why is it you know a church that has believed the you know, salvation sanctification Holy Ghost baptism for nearly 50 years why are the majority of the members and the workers and the people why are they not filled with the Holy Ghost they say God God has promised it, uh, Jesus only, uh, Jesus ever, Savior, Sanctifier, Baptizer, the coming King, and they sing it every time, but they never pray about it. That's why the power is not there. He says, thus says the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them, and I will increase them with men like a flock. This year will be different. The year of praying. And that amen is low. A year of consecration. A year of new life. A year of total commitment unto the Lord, all our soul, all our mind, all our heart, everything that we have, and want to forget the old year and come to the new year with fresh kind of passion and desire and consecration and seeking after the Lord, praying until He does what He has promised, it will happen in Jesus' name. It tells us in First John chapter one, reading from verse five. First John chapter one, we're reading from verse five. It says, "This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God." is light and in him is no darkness at all look at verse 6 verse 6 says if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth then in verse 7 it says but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another fellowship with one another what does that mean? Like we're sitting down, there's no fellowship, and just sitting down, quiet, we're not talking with anybody. That's right. In service, we don't talk with people, and we're not, um, you know, particularly thinking of anybody. It's not fellowship. I'm going to the fellowship. I'm going to the fellowship. I don't think so. The fellowship is when your heart is considerate of Him. Your mind is considerate of her. You're not thinking of personal self-satisfaction. You're thinking of, how can I bless him? How can I be a blessing to her? How can I cheer her up? 
How can I fulfill, be a part of her dream, to fulfill her dream? How can I show him, show her that somebody is here for you? I know your passion. I know your desires. I know everything you are thinking about, or maybe some of them. And I'm here to fulfill part of the goal that you have. That is fellowship. But when we just sit down, we're not concerned what happens to him. We're not concerned what happens to her. We're not concerned whether he's hungry or not. She's hungry or not. She has a problem or not. We're not concerned about that. We are so self-centered. Although we're in the midst of the people and we're sitting down together, we're not thinking of them. Their joy is not our joy. And we're not contributing anything to the progress of our life, progress of his life. There's no fellowship there. But then, if we say we have fellowship with one another, it says if we walk in the light I see it's in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ the son cleanses us cleanses us from all sin I pray this year there will be fellowship in our church yeah. fellowship yeah. fellowship yeah. you'll know the person living next door and when he's thirsty hungry, sick, depressed, unhappy, having a challenge of pressure upon him, upon her, you will know about it. And the fellowship you give them, what it takes to solve their problems, then we will know we are a church in fellowship. Amen? Amen. Point number two now, point number two is the confirmed healing in the new covenant the confirmed healing in the new covenant the lord is always interested in our body he's interested in our spirit in our soul in our body why because our body is the temple of the holy ghost and then he says i will dwell in you I will walk in you. That's why he's interested. Our body is not just like, okay, it's not important whether I feed the body or not. That's not important to God. It's important whether I'm, I keep the body clean and clear of everything that is destructive. Maybe he's not interested. He's interested because of the body he places on our body. After all, the body is the creation of God. And when it gets sick, he's interested. That the reason he has included the promise of healing and the performance of that healing in the covenant he has made. Look at this in Deuteronomy chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 12. It says, Wherefore it shall come to pass if ye hearken to these judgments and keep and do them that the Lord thy God. You are born again, the Lord thy God. You have given your heart to him, the Lord thy God. You have chosen the way of righteousness and the way of life is the Lord thy God. If you are not born again, yes, it's your creator, but it's not your redeemer. It's your creator, but it's not the Lord thy God. Because you are going to lay far away on the other side if you die as a sinner. But when you give your heart to the Lord, he goes to prepare a place for you. He says, he belongs to me and he will live with me forever. So is the Lord thy God. And it says that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which is swear unto thy fathers. What's the covenant? What do we have in the covenant? Look at verse 15. In verse 15, and the Lord will take away from thee all sickness. How many kinds of sicknesses? How many? All sickness and will put them, will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt which thou knowest upon thee. But 
He will lead them upon all them that hate thee. Look at Psalm 89, reading from verse 34. In Psalm 89, verse 34, my covenant will I not break. If there's any uh, thing broken in the covenant, it's not your side, it's your side. That you're looking away the other direction and you're not keeping to the terms of the covenant. It says, my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my leaves. It said, did I say I will heal? Did I say I will not put any disease upon you which you find upon the Egyptians? Did I say that you will not have the diseases of the world on you? Yes, that's my promise promise and that's my covenant and my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Verse 35, in verse 35 it says, once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. Somebody say amen. amen. What's your name? Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto mention your name now he will not lie to you the promise he has made is there every time and if you go to God in prayer and you say here am I what's your name you mention your name why are you here I belong to God, I'm born again I'm a child of God and I know you will not lie unto me Disease will not be in my body. Lord, heal me. Healing will come immediately. We're looking at Psalm. We're looking at uh, Exodus chapter 15. Uh, and we're reading from verse 26. Exodus 15. Uh, we're looking at verse 26. And said, if thou wilt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, I will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Amen is the Lord. It will heal you in Jesus' name. Uh, let, let's look here at Psalm 103. Psalm 103, we're reading from verse 1. Psalm 103, verse 1, it says, in Psalm 103, reading from verse 1, bless the Lord, O my soul, the soul that is pardoned, not having guilt, not having condemnation, not having confusion, not having negative, negative thoughts, can easily praise the Lord. That soul is positive. That soul is passionate. And that soul is praising the Lord every time. And because this psalmist now has been pardoned, has been purged, has been purified, has been cleansed, and has been converted, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Then in verse 2, it says, In verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits. In verse 3, it says, Who forgets? Give it all thine iniquities and heal it all thy diseases. That's what he will do for you. All diseases, all infirmities, everything gone in Jesus' name. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, he tells us about the mercy of the Lord and the covenant of the Lord. It says, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. What he did for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and what he did for David, and Samuel, and Jeremiah, the rest of them, what he did in Isaiah, and what he did in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, it says the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. 
upon them that honor him, upon them that reverence him, upon them that by action, by lifestyle, they hallow his name and his righteousness unto children's children. Look at verse 18, in verse 18, to such as keep his covenant. He forgives, he heals, he brightens your life, he renews your life like that of the eagle for those that keep his covenant and to remember that his commandment and to remember his covenant and to do them. Look at Psalm 105. I'm reading from verse 8. In Psalm 105, verse 8, he has remembered his covenant forever. And the end of the world has not come yet. This is part of that forever. And he has remembered his covenant forever. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath were unto Isaac. Verse 10. In verse 10 he says, and he confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel Israel for an everlasting covenant. Look at verse 37. Here is part of the covenant, and he remembers that forever and ever he brought them forth also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. I need a good, good amen there. That Think about, think about this, that all our branches, all our groups, all our churches, local churches, in every local government, in every region, in every state, think about all our members, in all the churches everywhere. If we could say the same thing, that we come into covenant relationship with the Lord and the boys and girls and the teenagers and the young people and the young professionals and the fathers and the mothers and the bachelors and the spinsters, everyone, if we can say there was not one feeble person among their tribes. It will happen. God is a faithful God and God is a God who fulfills promises when we love him and when we honor him with our obedience, our soul, our mind, our heart. Look at Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. And we're reading here from verse 4. It says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Verse 5 in verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. If we all together, if we're healed, I am healed. With his tribes, I am healed. The Lord confirmed that in every life in Jesus' name. We're coming to Matthew chapter 8 and we're reading from verse 16. Matthew chapter 8 and we're reading from verse 16. It says, when the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits. He cast out the spirits with what? With his word. And healed how many? All that were sick. Look at, look at this. They brought unto him all that was sick and possessed with devils. Now he wants to pray. And somebody goes apart. And Peter goes to him and says, the Lord is going to pray now. The fellow, and then Peter said, why are you standing alone by you? No, I'm not. I don't want prayer in the crowd. You are his disciple, apostle, take me to him, personal. If he can 
deal with my case personally, I'll be all right. How about this one he wants to do for everybody? Uh -uh, that's for them. You see, there are people that they do not understand that they don't have to have a personal, individual, isolated touch. That that same prayer must reach you today. Whatever is the challenge in your life, he brings healing. It's part of the covenant. It's part of what he has said he will do. So you don't have to, you know, go apart and say, no, that one is not for me. When he finishes, moderator, group pastor, tell him his daughter is waiting here and crying here. How about this prayer now? I say you tell him. He knows me. He knows my name. I'm his daughter. I'm his son. Why don't we obey the scriptures? They brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all. Praise the Lord is coming your way today. Yeah. Healed all that were sick. You know, that is the way we've done it every time. Because that follows the pattern of Jesus. The Lord will do it for you. Yeah. Many years ago, some years ago, some time ago, when I said many years ago, I think it's long, long ago, we went to South Africa. And that night, I was not the person preaching. It was another person preaching. And all of a sudden, the light went up. He didn't even have light, electric light, to do his preaching. And he had candles in their hands. And I was there because I didn't have any program that night. And, you know, our overseer said, they have been meeting this way to know what South Africa looks like and how they have their meetings. Can we go? So of course, we can go. And so we were there. Somebody preached. And the fellow that preached then just told the people, he didn't tell me ahead of time, he just told the people, uh, Pastor Kumoyi is here today and I've given you the word, he will come and pray for you now. I thought, look at this one, why didn't he tell me before, you know, beforehand? But you know, the power will always be with you. The anointing will always abide in your life. Our overseer that followed me that day will remember what I'm saying now as he hears this, you know, preaching going on. I think it's a way too part of, uh, uh, part of uh, Johannesburg or so. And then I got up there and I said, you know, somebody there, he should have gone for operation. Actually, he came from America because, uh, you know, his father is a writer of a popular book that Christians read almost in every country. And he came to survey South Africa so that um, they will see how to establish their work, their ministry in South Africa. He was in the meeting that night. And then I said, that person there uh, that has this problem in the hand, you should have taken that problem for operation, but you were afraid. Raise up your hand and you're going to be healed now. I wasn't prepared for that. And then I prayed and immediately instantaneously he was healed that night he called his father in America I said daddy something has happened he was afraid to go for operation because his senior sister had gone for similar operation before and had problem and challenges because of that he was afraid but it was a visible kind of uh, difficulty and challenge in the hand healed completely he called the father and then mentioned my name so the father got interested and you know i was in america and then he happened to be in the hotel where i was and he just met me and he said are you pastor so and so i said yes i am he said my son got a miracle in your meeting in south africa and uh, from that time uh, they now invited me into the programs they were having and the Lord has been walking. If the Lord can walk like that, that night, you today, you got it in Jesus' name. And so still in South Africa, we were there and, um, you know, a pastor 
a black, um, you know, black man like myself now, uh, he, they had a challenge in their church. These twins, uh, you know, twins, uh, maybe a boy and girl or whatever, they were having spiritual problem. That the twins will have a personality. They will not see the personality. He'll be cutting them with bleach and he will be uh, pinching them with uh, pins. And everybody could see the mark. They didn't see the hands doing it, but they saw all the marks, everything. And when it's freshly done, they'll see the blood coming out. And the children, those two, they'll be crying. And they didn't know what to do. It was a spiritual problem. And I happened to be in South Africa at that time. And then they called me and they said, uh, you know, these twins have uh, this problem while ministering in their church uh, that night. And, uh, you know, I prayed for those twins. And I said, those evil spirits and evil powers uh, tormenting the children tonight at uh, the last night. Don't come here, don't touch them anymore. Finished. I want somebody to shout, finished. And then the following day, the pastor was so excited. Those simple spirits, pinching them, cutting them like that, that was the end of it. And I say that this year and this January, all those tormenting spirits and tormenting powers in your life finish in Jesus name look at verse 17 here in verse 17 it tells us it said that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses gone from your life, God. From your parents, God. From your children, God. You will not lose your wife prematurely. And you will not lose your husband prematurely. God in Jesus' name. First Peter chapter 2 verse 24. In First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. You are healed in Jesus name. Point number three now. Point number three, the crucial holiness in the holy covenant. Crucial, essential, important, indispensable. Nothing, nothing is not a thing you can do without. You cannot do without this. It's a crucial, essential, important, indispensable holiness in the holy covenant in luke chapter 1 reading from verse 72 luke chapter 1 verse 72 to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant verse 73 the oath which is where to our father abraham 74 it says that he will grant unto us unto me Unto me, that we, being delivered out of the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear. No enemy will stop your progress. That dream the Lord had given you, no enemy will stop it or frustrate it in Jesus' name that he might deliver us from our enemies and that will serve him without fear. Somebody say amen. amen. Many things in our lives we have the calling to do. I'll do this, I'll do this. Sometimes it's a dream, a vision, a project you had had 
from your younger days. And I also want to move on and get that done. Fear. And people say, what's he trying to do? We who came before you have not done that. You want to do that. How can? Other people say, where are you going to get the resources? And because you fear, you might not have the resources. Then you settle for a lower thing. I know I cannot do that. Why not? Why not? Those who are doing it, what do they have? If they are Christians, they have God, you have God. And so, this year, you will fear nothing in Jesus' name. Some people remain in that little box where circumstances of life have boxed them up. And they cannot break the bonds, shatter all the things that bind them. And they remain there in that box. You'll come out of that box. There are things that can only be done outside that little box where you are. There are things that can only be done outside the comfort zone where you are. But fear will not allow people to come out of the comfort zone. I've never done that before. I've never faced an enemy like that before. I've never faced an opposition like that before. And so they remain where they were. And they carry that old heart, old concept. They don't believe that their progress depends on God, God alone, the covenanter, and them, the covenantee. They believe that although God promises this, although God promises that, but this enemy is so greater, more powerful than God, even if God wanted me to, if they don't want me to, what can I do? That's the problem, the fear of man. You are coming out of that this year. It says that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. Your helpers will come. The finance will come. Your protection is secured. Your life will be long enough to fulfill that dream in Jesus' name. Amen. Cast out the fear out of your mind. You will get there. Amen. Look at verse 75. In verse 75, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Can we be holy today? If we have the grace today, can we have the same grace tomorrow? Can we have the grace the following day? Can we be holy for one week? Yeah. Can we be holy for one month? The grace we enjoyed one day, three days, one week, one month. Can we enjoy the grace for the next month? And so... If one will say a lifetime, a lifetime is one day at a time. And so a life of holiness is holiness one day at a time. A day of, a day of faith and a day of progress is, uh, you know, a life of progress is progress one day at a time. A day of faithfulness, a life of uh, faithfulness and fearlessness is one fearless day at a time. You don't need to worry about tomorrow, about next week, about next year. One day at a time, you live without fear. One day at a time, you live above and beyond all your enemies. Why are you saying amen like you don't know? One day at a time. One day at a time. Over there, the right one step at a time. And if you can have, that's what I'm reading before me there, if you can have one step at a time, one day at a time, holiness will be the lot of your life. Yeah. 
Uh, we're coming to Isaiah chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Gonzaga died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Then in verse 2, in verse 2 it says, Above its two, the seraphims, each one had six wings, and with, uh, with twain, he covered his face, and were twain, he covered his feet and were twain, he did fly. Verse 3, and in verse 3 it says, And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is, uh, is full of thy glory. In verse 4, it tells us, And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and uh, the house was filled with smoke. Then in verse 5, uh, here comes I say, and then said, I woe is me, for I am, I am on done because I am a man of unclean lips, the Lord will cleanse your lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of foes. And then in verse 6 it says, and then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a light coal in his hand, which he had taken uh, with tongues from up the altar. Then in verse 7, it says, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. The Lord will touch your lips, will touch your tongue, will touch your heart. And then it says, and thine iniquity is taken away. He had been a prophet. And God cannot use a sinner who had not been converted as his prophet, as his mouthpiece. He was saved. But now, when he saw the glory of God and the holiness of God, he cried unto the Lord. He said, that original lip, original nature, original language is still here with me. And I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. And then God commanded, and the angel came and took a coal, live coal, and touched his leaves and said, your iniquity is taken away. It was done for him, it will be done for you. And thy sin purged. And then in verse 8, the Lord said, also I had the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I. Here am I. Converted, here am I. Consecrated, here am I. Cleansed, here am I. Purified and purged, here am I. I forget the old life of uselessness. I come now, this year will be a profitable year. All around in your life, serving God, serving, the, serving in the church, serving outside the church, serving everywhere, you can come and say, Lord, cleanse me, Lord, purge me, Lord, purify me, Lord, take the Adamic nature away, change my view, change my language, change everything within me. Here I am now available, here am I, send me, and the Lord will use you mightily this year in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 35, and I'm reading from verse 4. Isaiah chapter 35, we're looking at it from verse 4. Say to them that of a fearful heart, be strong and fear not. The Lord sent me to tell you, this year, be strong. In your heart, be strong. In your mind, be strong. If your enemies are strong, you must be stronger. If your enemy is stronger than you are, they'll almost trample on you every time. They'll almost push you down every time. If your enemies are stronger than you are, they will impose that negative attitude on you. And you'll just be there trembling. But this year, you'll be stronger than your enemies. You'll be stronger than your persecutors. Now, if your enemy is stubborn, 
you must be stubborn too towards him. You see, uh -uh. you were after me last year. You were after me after the, the other year. You were after me three years ago. And actually, many things I should have done, I didn't do because you were after me. And, and they, don't, they don't recognize your crime. They don't recognize your fearfulness. They don't recognize your weakness. They don't recognize pleading and begging. They are just stubborn. Now, this year, you must be more stubborn than your enemy. Yeah. You will succeed this year. Yeah. You will climb that mountain this year. Yeah. And the Lord says, be strong and fear not. It's fear that crushes us. And then we're not able to achieve what the Lord has raised you. Why are you alive? Why are you alive at this age? If you're not supposed to do something, you know, what would God keep you alive and tell you, I'm not taking you home now. Stay there. And then what he's told you to stay there for, the fear of a little person there, the fear of an unsafe person there, the fear of a backslider there will not allow you to do what you are sent here, what God is keeping you here to do. You break that yoke this year. Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. He will save you from their hands. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, then the eyes of the